Yes, we can hear you. All right, welcome back to Thomas Cole today. Um, I guess he merits as much time as he's getting in this class because he is sort of the founder of the American Landscape School and actually one of the founders of American art because America as a country was quite new when he was born, after all, 1801. And um, there we had this portrait of him by one of his most admiring followers, uh, Asher Durand. Oh, I see. Just Did everybody see that in the way too much? Can we lower the light a little bit? Yes. Thank you. And we want things just right. <laughs> yeah, this is the last day. Oh, yeah, yeah there we go. Much better. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I again have material that's sort of related. I can bring it together through Thomas Cole, but it's about landscapes, it's about early American art, and then they're just focusing it through his work. Those of you who weren't here last week, uh, just uh, on those who were, a reminder from that long ago time that he was an artist who was largely self-trained and born in Lancashire, England. His parents both involved in cloth manufacture. Uh, he was watching the whole transformation of Northern England into an industrial environment, which he deplored. Um, his father was not successful as an industrial manufacturer, so the family moved to um, Pennsylvania uh, Cole's training himself was uh, just an apprenticeship in tangentially related to fabrics that was pre, um, making the wooden engravings for patterns on cloth. And from there, he just obviously had a clear interest in art. His sister became an artist too. So there was something in the family blood. Um, and he would copy engravings and I said he was he was copying what was on teacups and that, on pottery, just everything to learn how to draw um, without any lessons. Then he, he moved to uh, Philly, where there was the Pennsylvania Academy of Art, and there he began to see art and to have a few lessons. But he's still essentially a self-trained man. Uh, and so he moved to New York City in the mid 1820s. And this is the time when New York City is transforming. And there's one reason that Hudson River School is the school or why it's called the Hudson River, because of the Hudson River. That's a, I hope you got that point, right? <laughs> well, so why? It, the Erie Canal opened in 1820. And the Erie Canal, for the first time, made it possible for goods industrial goods, somewhat industry, wood, crops, to make their way from the Great Lakes across to Albany, down the Hudson, out the New York Harbor into Europe. So it was a great source of a sudden growth in the wealth of New York and the whole country. And there was now not just goods, but people could move back and forth. So this was just um, the real flowering at the beginning. And as the transportation of goods came, so came transportation and people. Another big change was with the development of the steamboat in 1807. So people could easily get up and down the, that's, maybe I should even back up on this as a kind of a, a truth that's hard to remember in, in the modern era. Um, the chief form of transport was by water. Uh, you think in Europe, wherever they're, the major cities, they're on the water because that travels, the transport is, is easy and rapid and you don't have maintenance as you do with roads and you don't have pirates as you do with roads. 
So um, to have this transport on the water was so very important. And Europe, people from Europe began to come over as tourists as well, because the word came out that this was a beautifully forested mountain area that was wild in a way that nothing in Europe was wild. And so they came to see that. And that's what Cole, of course, is going to um, exaggerate in, in a way in his work. So I just wanted to show you some engravings from this time. Some of these are from books that were published in Europe showing this would be what, if you came, these are picturesque views of America. That's the title of the book that they came from. And you see how the water's dotted with so many sailboats and then that one small modest steamboat. By the middle of the 19th century, then there were some trains that ran along the river. But initially in Cole's life, it's steamboats and sailboats. Or another one. And one of the scenic places they would go was to West Point. This is actually a Courier and Ives print of West Point. Courier and Ives made its fortune initially from views of the New York Harbor, New York, and West Point. So this is what Thomas Cole did when he was 1825. He took his first trip up the Hudson. And he took just sketchbooks and um, sketch things that he saw. And he was drawn to certain particular things. It's clear that he loved these gnarled old trees, which he infuses with human life, don't they? I mean, this one so much looks like it's long hair and gnarled limbs, uh, very much a, an elderly person here. And that he's a very good draftsman. Well, of course he was already from his work with the wood engravings. But he's just, um, so this is a sort of detail. So he, he amasses these notebooks of just details of nature that he sees. And these are from notebooks somewhat later, not worrying about the dates of them, that on sketching trips he would then take views, and on um, this one you can see where he's sketched in notes to himself. They're often notes about the color or the condition of the sky. I think he must have used a straight edge for the building because I just can't believe that he could. It was that precise, but perhaps he was. Or another one. And the remarkable thing is that there is so little here. He just sort of a line for the outline. Again, almost like it's an engraving. And the rest he's either having to carry in his head or he's going to create when he comes back to his studio in New York City and begins to create paintings of them. Because that's what he decided after that first trip is that he wanted to be a landscape artist. So we take all the the facts that would apply to him and everyone else, what you do when you're an, a landscape artist in the, especially before about 1860. First of all, you did not paint in front of the scene. Uh, this even continued, well, yeah, 1860, I'd say, even in Europe even. Uh, uh, for a while, that was for a purely practical reason, which is that there was not yet any paint in tubes. And the paint instead like would be in these little globular forms down here. Those are um, bits of pig bladder. And then the pigment would be put in there. You would go to a, a color man and you, who would create the colors for you. And then they would be put in these bladders and then they were tightly wound to keep them sealed until you want to use them. But you used it by pricking the pig batter. And once you have the paint, even if it doesn't spill all over, it's going to dry out. So you couldn't have a very broad palette and you have to deal with mess, a lot of mess, uh, if you're working in color. In your studio, that was much easier to handle. But if you're have it in portable equipment, you can't do very much. So the, um, 
there were some oil sketches and uh, he taught some people how to do oil sketches, but you'd choose just a few colors and work kind of roughly, just get an idea. Then you see he has a very small palette. This, this is a small box. It's, it's up in the National Coal Historic Site uh, in the Catskills. So there are his brushes and his little palette. And he, at some point, painted in the back of the lid. It's not an identifiable scene, and it has a temple in it, whether this is one he took with him on his first or second trip to Italy, we don't know, but this is his traveling kit. And this would be what artists in generally would have if they took any color into the country. But mainly what they did was bring back their sketches and their, their, their drawings and their oil sketches. Here, let me show you an oil sketch by him. This one. This one that eight, near toward the end of his life, 1840s, a view in the Catskills. And you can see how quickly he's just rubbed it in. Uh, <clears throat> they would take all these back to their studios and uh, then complete their paintings there. The other reason it was advantageous working in the studio is that's where you could invite people to come in and see your work. Because this is before there was a system of dealers. So how do you make that critical leap from what you have in front of you to the money that you want from it? Uh, <clears throat> it was, you did it by knowing people who knew people who, and inviting them into your studio, or as Cole did, and I'll give you more of that story today, he uh, had the color man, that's the person who prepared his colors and he bought his canvases from. Uh, his color man agreed to show some of his paintings in his shop window in Manhattan. And that's the story of how Cole got started. And this was one of those three paintings, 1826, 1827, that made his name. Um, this one is in the Allen Art Museum in Oberlin. This is landscape with dead trees. I do not carry around in my head what the size of this is. Oh, I don't think I even wrote it down. Not too big. I, I, how would I know not too big? Well, he's still having to subsidize himself. He doesn't have a, a patron who's commissioning the painting or a benefactor who's just providing him with an allowance. So he's going to work on a fairly modest scale. And you see how he's made use of his drawings of these gnarly trees and how he's uh, doing a variation on the formula for landscapes. It has that dark foreground, trees on one side, trees on the other, so you've got a frame for it. Um, so it's a selected view. Well, we know he's composed this view. It's not something that he, he had in front of him, but it's composed according to the formulas of an appropriate landscape. But here, the fact that it is so without human habitation is what would make it appealing. Because to the Americans too, one of the great things about their country was the vast wilderness. Then the, I want to go back through the ones last time I showed you from the Catterskill Falls. Now this is the drawing he made on site. The white, I'm sure that's he came back to his studio and filled that in for the water. But this is what it looked like. And you can see there from just those um, straight edged structures at the top. Well, that straight edge tells you it's a structure. It's not something natural. There were viewing platforms because this was already well known and people were coming here to view the falls. And you can get in underneath there and sort of the cavernous space. So it was, it was a, a favorite spot to go. And he has roughly sketched in some trees, got a lot darker on the lower right side, mm, 
trees are kind of spindly looking there, that he's just kind of like working out an idea. And he's written notes on this as well. And this is then what he does in the studio. So this time, I want to carry out two further investigations on this. How is this different from that sketch? Color, first of all. But, say, so look at the trees on the left on this one. They're just sort of like, like round leaves, nice, you know, some bare trees the way he likes them. They're standing fairly upright. Now they lean, they're red. There must be a wind blowing because you can see the lean is the same on, on those leaves on both sides. So you get some idea that there's some atmosphere here. And although he'd gone in the spring, he's made it a fall scene because the color is much more eye attracting, more appealing. Why do people take their chips up the Hudson in the fall? It's to see the foliage. <clears throat> and he's now added a dramatic sky. So he's enhanced all the drama to the scene. It would be unthought of for a landscape artist at this time to give an accurate rendition of what they saw. Because then, what's the artist done? There has to be something that is the, the input, either ennobling or drama or story or color, something that makes it worthy of being a work of art, or turns it into a work of art. And the water plashes down, splashes in a way it doesn't in the drawing. Oh, I don't get way too over here myself. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, so more or less, although American portraits are like <laughs> to other European artists because they were absolutely too realistic with all the warts and bumps, because that's what Americans wanted. They wanted an accurate representation. They didn't sufficiently appreciate how important it was to be ennobled. <laughs> so that's why I'm wondering if you have an accurate portrayal in watercolor and then well, it's not the accuracy, but there has to be something, the contribution of the artist's mind and spirit, not just his eye and his hand or her eye and hand. Now, this is... Um, Another one point related to this, this is, um, I think this was a lithograph, also made by Cole a few years later. It's almost the same view, because how do these works get known once someone buys it, goes into their collection? It might be shown once a year if there's a show at a major institution or something like that. You have to have reproduction reproductions. And there were engravings, wood engravings, steel engravings, and the beginning of lithography, so that people even in Europe could know what Cole was doing or could know what Catterskill Falls looked like, because they had published these black and white illustrations. And that's how most people were got their imagery. Oh, don't tell me I've done that again. What was that I've done before? I just had to touch it someplace outside of. Yeah, yeah, but I'm touching the arrow. It's whatever I miss, miss did last time. Who's going to come to my aid? Uh, up and down arrow. Oh, I got into this the last time we did is that oh, you're not I have to touch someplace outside. You're not using the mouse? No. Oh. Using this. 
but um, maybe you want to get rid of that. Was that on the whole time? I have no idea. Shouldn't work. <laughs> Remember the last time you said push yeah. it outside somewhere, but mm. is there people's computers? I don't I mean is it next? No. Um, Should I touch something over here? I mean, I think maybe. I, I don't. I don't. I mean, without be without seeing what you're doing. Right. But it's not moving. Right. Um, they stop showing and show again. Uh -huh. You really want to? I don't. I just. I don't understand how you're doing. How you're moving the. Um, and it's not moving. I've been doing this to advance. This. That. Uh huh. But you see, it's not moving. I'm sorry. It's not a color illustration for you to be looking at anyway. I guess I don't, I don't understand why you even have a mouse if you're not using it. No, it was just here. That's why. Because he told me to use those. I think he's on his lunch break now. Um, all right. Should we, should we try stop sharing? Yeah. That didn't help. It just that did that. What it did was it took it away for screen share. Let's try it again. Um, well, at least we see the image there for the first time. I have no idea. I don't, this setup is blowing my mind. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Um, yeah, I've never seen it. Last week it, you had the picture right there and on the I don't know how we can see view frame, view page source. Because I wasn't aware that I even did anything different now. Yeah. Um, so, so when I when I have issues, so here's click the thing. What now, I, I okay. Click, I'm, look. Okay. You're gonna use that. I'm just, no, gonna, no, no, no. But I don't. There's no button. I just went down here and clicked. So let's try it now. Here. See, and now it's gonna work. Okay. Because yeah, so, so this, what happened last this time? This move. Yeah, just move. Just, mm -hmm. just keep going. With well, that, and if it happens again, slide, don't my, worry. It's slide, okay. my, slide my papers out. Okay, under just it. lift this up. Slide my papers under there. No, no, we need the paper. Oh, you need, you need the paper. Well, I might Take want to paper. get some information. Yeah. So we leave this comfortably That's fine. there. It should okay. be okay. Yeah, okay. You're good. Go back. That's fine. It should be fine. Yeah, as long as this doesn't move. Yeah, just leave it. Okay. okay. Right. I'm sure you recognize this by now. Yeah. So there are the falls again, and then remember there was a. He, he did another version of it, which was bought um, by Daniel Wadsworth and Wadsworth as a name, uh, as if the person is standing, say, within that grotto and looking at the falls. Now, I. I had wish, I was wishing as that was going on, that we'd gotten to this next image. Because at that point, I have something to read to you, a long thing to read to you. This is one of the three paintings that was in the shop of his color man. And this is an article that was published in the New York Evening Post in 1825. Now you think this is a young man, he's 24. And this is the publicity he gets, this is written by someone else. About a month ago, Mr. Cole, a young man from the interior of Pennsylvania, placed three landscapes in the hand of Mr. Coleman 
a picture dealer in this city, hoping to obtain $20 a piece for them. There they remained unnoticed by the Mycenases who purchased Guido's, Raphael's, and Titian's. Let me tell you, they were not really Guido's, Raphael's, or Titian's. In Mycenas, it just meant somebody who had some money. Uh, and there they might have remained if an artist who himself placed some of his own productions in the hand of Mr. Coleman, that's the picture dealer, <clears throat> had not gone to inquire for his proceeds. On casting his eyes upon one of the pictures by Mr. Cole, he exclaimed, where did this come from? And continued gazing, almost incapable of understanding the answer. When informed that what he saw was the work of a young man, untutored and unknown, he immediately purchased the painting for $25. The price Mr. Coleman had prevailed upon the painter to affix to his work, adding, Mr. Cole, keep the money, uh, Mr. Coleman, keep the money due to me and take the balance. If I could, sir, I would add to it. This honorable testimony to the merits and genius of Mr. Cole was from Colonel Trumbull, one of the best known American painters of his time. Colonel Trumbull immediately mentioned his purchase to another artist, and in this highest term of eulogium, eulogy, um, that artist waited in the Colonel's room, room while the picture was sent for, and immediately exclaimed, this is beyond the expectation you had raised. After gazing with wonder and delight, he hastened to see the remaining two, purchased one, and left the other one only for lack of money. These pictures will now be seen with delight by those who visit our academy, and they will be astonished when they compare them with the works of the first European masters. Get this? We are as good as anything in Europe. Um, and, that, and to add that, an American boy, compar boy, comparatively speaking, for such truly as a man of 22, who's equaled those works, which had been the boast of Europe and the admiration of ages. Can you imagine starting out with that kind of, not bad. And he provided, uh, this case, I think this is a wood engraving of his paintings also to be published in Europe. I want to show one, one other early painting by him from this mid 1820s. And it's, um, it's just called, uh, Oh, no, I have to go back. Because there's some we got mess in, in all this tumult. This is a detail from the Catterskill Falls. The one human figure in here. These are what are called peopled landscapes, populated landscapes. So Cole, uh, when he did this, eliminated the viewing platforms eliminated all the tourists who went there, replaced the people who might be there with this Indian on appropriate scale. So he's going to make it look wilder, more exotic in this way. And I want to get to the issue of the Indian. At that time, they weren't called Native Americans. And was around this time he did the last of the Mohicans. You get that word, the last of the Mohicans? These paintings are, again, going back to what I said last time, we know what pictures teach us. We know from what images tell us. And these are images that tell us that there are fewer and fewer Indians. That the, there, this now is what is called the myth of the vanishing tribe. This is uh, part of a widespread, uh, it, it feeds into the widespread, let's say, belief at that time that Native Americans would naturally die out and were dying out to be replaced by superior whites coming from Europe. And this is just a couple of years in the time when in the South there was the great the veil of um, Trail of Tears where Southern Indians were forced to go to the other side of the Mississippi River. So there's content 
in this being just one Indian, no Americans and no tourists. A part of the a detour of that, from that, that I found also, since we're talking about looking at the landscape, looking at America, uh, I found this. This is a view in the, it's the diplomatic dining room in the White House with a panoramic wallpaper <clears throat> made by a Frenchman who had never been to the United States. And this, in the um, early 19th century, the wallpaper was installed under Jackie Kennedy with her Francophile interests. But the Frenchman had been told to do a wallpaper that showed Niagara Falls, West Point, Boston Harbor, and the Natural Bridge in Virginia as characteristic American scenic spots. And the manufacturer of this paper had been explicit that there needed to be Native Americans in it. And this is what he wrote, the, the man who did this. He, said, uh, he wrote to his employer, I hope this scene of Indians will completely satisfy. I believe there are few landscapes in which you will find as many Indians as these, which is true. Uh, so this is the scene in Virginia where the Indians are entertainers. And now back to the, in every one of these paintings, you know, you learn to expect that there will be some kind of alteration or um, agenda in the work. This is a, a view that Cole took from an area very close to the Catskill Mountain House. It's now gone, but any of you been to like the Mohawk Mountain House, it was just like that in the Catskills. And it was the place you would go if you were a tourist, a European tourist, and, and you would go hike out from there and, and appreciate the wilds. And there was just this little escarpment in front of it. And that's the view that Cole is presenting here. So for tourists who had seen this, if this is then in a, an engraving, they've gone back to Europe, they have a, something, a, a, an aid memoir of the trip, or for people who go there from the US, oh yes, I saw that, that was so wonderful. But they never did see this because Cole moved the mountain to give a view of the Hudson from that. You had to stand someplace else actually to see the Hudson. But it's a wonderful one. You have the mist just rising down below. Uh, the Catskill Mountain House was known for people's, um, uh, the staff would go around and wake you up at dawn so that you could see daybreak over the Hudson. So this has that kind of connection to it. But it's a wonderful distant landscape with that pearly, pearly light and not yet many clouds. And still you can imagine the cool. And as you watch, those little wisps would fade. So you can imagine your way into it. There's his beloved gnarled trees in the foreground. And it is in a way like a panorama. You can sort of imagine like the cores, that rock and that you could look around all the way and see the mountains that surrounded you. This is a view he did later in life showing where that Catskill Mountain House was. So then he goes to a um, man in Baltimore, likes his work enough to say, I will support you for a trip to Europe. And he went to um, Europe for three years. First, as we saw last time, going to England, uh, where he saw the works of Constable and Turner, and became acquainted with both of them, and evidently did think that he would be able to sell on a par with them. But the clients he could find there turned out to be only Americans, so it was not really successful. He did not return to an English reputation. But 
what they these artists were doing so intensified his interest in the really romantic, dramatic quality of a landscape. And from there he went to Italy. He had a studio in Florence and he'd spent time in Rome. So he did this view of, a, the quality of the reproduction is not good, but of an aqueduct, this great sweeping view, just a goat to humanize it. A view near Tivoli, with again, the little bits of cloud caught in the crevices there of those mountains and some clouds piling up. There's a rushing stream at the bottom over here at the left. So you can imagine the sound, you can feel the temperature, and there are a few peasants going around the scene. And that's a part of an ancient aqueduct. There's a Roman ruin and there's even a medieval tower on the top of a Roman ruin. And over that ancient aqueduct, there's a modern road. And this is a theme that um, Cole uh, will work with a lot, or what he's, he's obviously thinking about a lot. And that's the passage of time in the land. Here there's one, one culture came and left, another culture came and left, and now there's a new one. So when he came back to New York, um, he had a very grand patron, a man named Lumen Reed, who was a wealthy cloth manufacturer who had um, decided to have a great collection of art to make a European and American collection of art that would rival any in Europe. It's the basis of what's at the National Historical Society because uh, he died early, but he, I'll go through these next ones quite fast. Probably. Oh, no, that is. You'll tell me when to stop. He, he, he thought of himself as one of these Mycenaeuses, uh, but he had a grand house down on uh, Greenwich Street. And he wanted to have a third floor gallery of paintings. And he commissioned Cole to do a series of paintings. Cole, the two men worked for a long time what the name should be. It's the course of empire. And I think if people have any awareness of Cole's name that um, in a general way, it's probably for these paintings. Now they're not especially landscape paintings, but... Um, You should see them. So he, he, he started out, he wanted to have as many paintings as they would be in a Roman um, a house, say, um, from Pompeii or Her Herculaneum. And then they were working with various schemes and finally settled on, this is the way it was shown once. Have any of you seen this in the historical society? Well, let's okay. Just to remind you of the sizes on these, since I don't have anybody here in the picture. First of all, this is what he said about choosing, because Reed was just saying, do me a series of paintings. I want something really good, inspiring, the best. So Cole wrote to him and said, I've been dwelling on many subjects and looking forward to the time when I can put them on canvas. I think it's the duty of the artist to employ his abilities for his mission, if I may so term it, is a great and serious one. His work ought not to be a dead imitation of living things without the power to impress a sentiment and force a truth. He wanted a higher style of landscape something that will carry some of the life's verities in it. So he does this series. 
and it's a series of five, and they're three by five feet. Uh, four of them are, and then there's a large one. This is called the savage state. This is the beginning of civilization. A few hunters. Wild, unruly nature, the clouds just beginning to dispel. This is early dawn, because when you, there's one motif that stays in every painting, that uh, mat with a little rock perched at the top on the, you see how the light is only hitting the top there? So you know the sun is just coming up. So it's the dawn of civilization, the dawn of time. Then the Arcadian or pastoral style. People are present now and they have tamed nature to some extent. There's farming, there's uh, woodworking, there's shipbuilding, there's worship of some kind. You see he has a version of Stonehenge in the background there. And people live in sort of wigwams. Now you know where you would get the idea of them. And it's a cloudless morning and a nice balance between nature and human activity. Just some of the details. That little youngster who's down scratching on the rock, that actually is scratching Cole's name on there. So it may be that that's thought to be the beginning of art. It may be putting himself in there, the beginning of art and, and culture. And there's some music, dancing. See, Piper piping and dancing. And look at the lower right-hand corner, which is the corner of the picture. This you will see frequently. It's a tree, but it's not one of those that's worn or blasted by lightning. This is a tree that's been cut down. This, this is humanity beginning to destroy the natural world. Then the large one, that's it's almost seven feet across. Um, the consummation of empire. Just, this looks like a Hollywood extravaganza, isn't it? It's like, uh, he labored over this painting. It just did not come easily to him. But uh, there's things from Greek architecture, Roman architecture. There's the Parthenon up there. Um, there are the seeds further of downfall because on that bridge going across, the figure in red high up, this time it's not Hannibal, but it's a man on a, an elephant, but it's a Roman emperor coming back and triumph from some conquest over other people. There's just details of it. So this is partly what Europeans, Americans, they're just so, they're so fascinated by realistic details, you know, don't they? Can't they lift up, generalize, ennoble in, in other ways, but Americans preferred this kind of work. And then comes destruction. Of course, you have a great fire, and look at those sweeping clouds and smoke swirling across the scene, everything rushing to one side in the opposite direction from the beginning of the day, right? At the beginning, everything was moving to the right. Now it's moving to the left. So both sides culminated at center. And desolation. Human society is ultimately overwhelmed again by nature. Now, this is Cole's own 
view of life and life history based on his religious beliefs and also on what he observed when he was a youngster in England. Is that closer detail? See how quiet it is now with the moon? The serenity of that landscape? All human vanity has come to nothing. So at the same time he was doing that, working on that series, he did the Oxbow. So that's the one you go to the Met to see. And it's also a very large painting. I don't know how we are for time for you, if you can stay through this. I don't want to have a five, five lectures on the Oxbow. Good, good. So the size of this painting, um, actually, let me give you the full title. That's the short title. It's a view from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts, after a thunderstorm, the Oxbow. And it's 1835, 1836, and this is as big as that one of the glories of empire. And actually, he'd done a sketch for the glories underneath this one. I always looked at this as just a really gorgeous, sweeping, panoramic landscape. And it is most certainly panoramic. But only when I started to work for this did I look closely enough to see that embedded in this is the same message as in that course of empire. His basically pessimistic view of progress. So uh, I have many details of this, and as a very famous painting, there are many images to show you. So there's been a storm. It's clearing off. Uh, so in the lands that, are, um, that have been farmed, you can see now people are going about their business. There is still rain in the distance, you can tell on the left. And um, the clouds are just moving away. This emphasis on clouds and skies, I guess I better state another one of the um, basic beliefs, really assumptions of people at the time, that you go out in nature to be in contact with the divine. When you look at the skies, you are in the presence of divinity. Uh, that is where you can most clearly and purely have direct, immediate, sensory, and overwhelming contact. So the skies mean something. They are not just, like, oh, what a great morning sky, or what a fantastic cloudy sky. Those are statements of deep religious content, as was understood by the time. So he, this is just one of his original sketches from the little sketchbook, and it's just little tiny sketchbooks. But you see, he's thinking of it like a panorama already. It's not just on one piece of paper. He's, he's, he wants you to think it's really expansive nature. This is from Google Earth. So that you can see where the oxbow is and, and um, sort of working out where Cole could have um, positioned himself to see the site. Um, the apparatus at the front of the room here is somewhat getting in the way. Uh, what's at the very center at the bottom? I'll show you a detail where you'll be able to see it, but it's Cole very well dressed, with his hat on, cravat, and a paint filled brush, and a canvas in front of him is Cole painting. Cole is painting this view. And then, but a little bit to the left, there's his 
uh, umbrella when it's the day's really sunny. You'll see details to this. Um, so the, over here to the right, rather, there's, there's a slanted umbrella and his camp stool that he would sit on and a portfolio. And that's where he signed it. Well, now think about it. where 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 are we? Yeah, we have to be on a much higher space. We're down. We're looking down on the artist, who's looking down on the scene, like one of those panoramas. And he's looking. You'll see. He's looking up at us to invite us in to what he's observing. Well, of course, that was the source of this. He said this from the, um, Turner that interest in this. That Hannibal crossing the Alps that he saw when he was in London, these great skies, and the way he paints the skies, those kind of sweeps of big, broad strokes of color. That comes from what he's picked up from Turner. So I'm, we'll start at the left, reading it just as you would a book. We'll go to the left and then just move to the right. So there's one of his beloved, worn trees. Clearly, must have been lightning struck that one. Leaning out of the scene, there's still some wind blowing the leaves here. That's uh, the storm is passing. And he himself collected leaves. He collected, he is very, this specimen of this kind of tree, this kind of leaf, he is very interested in all the, not only this sweeping view, but all the specifics of nature. and the wonderful sky. And look at those birds. Not the conventional, you know, the crossing the sky, da, 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 da. but they're really wheeling around as the sky, you know, they're finally up off their branches and wheeling around. And the light shifts as some places the rain is still slanting down and other places it's a little bit lighter and the light comes through. And then you see the lightning. There's still some storm in progress. I just love those birds. <laughs> and on to the landscape, which looks to me so tranquil, so utterly pastoral. But in his view, you see that is a taming of a nature that should be left as nature. That that is the beginning of human destruction. This is like that, that phase just before the height of empire. This is to him a warning. And the only place I can see it that I know to look is when you look at the distant mountain hill, you see those bare patches, it's been clear cutting. Because there's just been wanton destruction of areas to some now owns that property, they're raising all the trees. And there he is, debonair in his best, looking toward us to join him in observing the scene with some lovely colored flowers around him. We could have been his companion. Perhaps for us, that's our, our, our seat. The puffs of smoke from various farmsteads. Industry on the water. Sheep, crops. Some areas under the cloud and still in shade and some in light. Some of the water channeled. There's the part of clear cutting. Mm -hmm. 
And it was a kind of a godlike view of human activity, right? You, you're up so high up above this looking at it. This is something completely different. This is by an artist who was born in 1951, Stephen Hannock. He did two paintings um, of the Oxbow. And let me give you the, the titles for these because this is somewhat amusing. The Oxbow after church, after coal, flooded, flooded river for the matriarchs, Ian, it's um, Betty and Agnes Mongan. So it's a long, very typical contemporary title. And it is an uh, oil painting, but he's, he's uh, sort of enameled the surface with it. And he's done something in this one and in the next one that's uh, quite interesting. In the area where there would be a crop down below, this uh, area where the orange is, that's script. He's put in passages from his diary. So that completely contemporizes this, this work of art that now he humanizes it, he brings in his life, he makes you know this is flat, just like writing goes on a flat piece of paper, that's not a distant landscape. Oh, he's just taped it and turned it around. Oh. Tell me how many minutes I have left. This is his house in, in the Catskills. He moved up there in 1832. I think I'll go beyond that. Where, where is that in the Catskills? It is in Catskill. It's in the Catskills? In, I think I have the address. I think it's like in Catskill itself. It's in Catskill itself. And have you ever been to Olana? It's Frederick Church's house. It's just right across the way from there. Next time you'll look at a little of Frederick Church because he was his most ardent disciple. Disciple. Um, I'm going to show you only one more. I, I will tell you, you're getting a, a warped view of Cole here. He did also do landscapes where there are religious figures in there. Um, I don't think any historical scenes, maybe one or two. So sometimes they're not just landscapes per se. But this is one of a landscape in in the in the area. This he did shortly before his year before he died. And there's something different here, which you can not see too clearly until you look at the detail. Land has changed, the train has come. This may be, it's thought to be, the first representation of a train in a painting, even before Turner did his. So now you know for him, it's a destruction. And on that happy note, I stop. <laughs> so does anybody have questions or want to go back and look at anything in, in here? Yeah. Um, they're often like about three by four feet. Well, you see, they, they would be most of them for houses. Uh, and in your house, you'd have it so invite everybody to get really close to see all the detail. And then if they're reduced as, as wood engravings, they're in a book. And likewise, in a book, you can spend your time just absorbed in what you see here and what you see there. But it is, it's just extremely finicky. And you can shop for two sections and bring it together in the show? They are separate paintings. Yeah, you have to go see them. They're impressive. Was that gallery club? The five, I mean, there was four or five paintings in the one area. Was that at the museum up there that, where you were? No, that's in the New York Historical Society. They're all there. You can go go oh, see them. Okay. All right, Maggie. For those of us, yeah, that, just across the street from the Natural History. For those of us that are online, all right. We yeah, didn't yeah, have yeah, yeah. When you say 
said that the, the landscape painter felt the need to add something. I mean, that's how you're getting that. Like you. I mean, did they write about yes. your ideas? This is what he's saying that no mere dead representation of something living that you have to put yourself in there too, something of your philosophy. Art until the late 19th century was instruction. It wasn't an exploration of artistic problems. It had a more important function in society. That's one reason why landscapes were so slow to come in because they didn't carry as much meaning except to the Dutch because they built the country themselves. Yes, they reclaimed it from the sea. Landscapes didn't inherently have that same meaning until people began to think of this transcendental concept of God as the God, the sky God, the God of the land. Yeah. Sure. Is that in the foreground though? Oh, that's just a detail of this one. Oh, not that. No, there, there it is. That's the one with the, the train in the background. It's also, it looks like he's, it is a statement of what life was then, but there's a, there's a hunter out there with his gun. Um, there are more trees that have been cut down. It's not nature, living nature. Any more? Keep them coming. I love it when I have questions. I love that. All right. Well, Maggie, can you hear me? Let's wish us luck next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's going to be next week? Well, I, I'm not really sure. But uh, Frederick, Frederick Church, I'll show you some Frederick Church and the Escher Duran that's from the New York Public Library. And then I want to do the Luminous, the ones that did the New Jersey Great Skies. And then after that, we're going to get to the West, to Bierstadt.